Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation as usual as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about everyone. I'm Lori LeBay, your host of Alzheimer Speaks, and I'm thrilled that you're back with us today. For those of you that are new, if you're not familiar with Alzheimer Speaks Radio, we are about sound information, not just sound bites. We want to have real conversations with real people in the trenches. So we talk to people all over the world at all different levels, from those living with the diagnosis to those caring for them, business professionals, movie directors, all different types of businesses, authors, singers, songwriters, kids, everybody has a place within dementia. And we want to have them on the show and hear their perspectives. Also, I want to mention if you liked our opening song, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Artisan Band. And you can download that on any of your favorite music platforms. Now with COVID still looming, I know people are always looking for resources. So I highly, highly recommend Dementia Map. We have all kinds of resources, 150 categories you can search along with an events calendar, many which are free, as well as a blog and a glossary. So uh, go to DementiaMap.com and um, gather some more information there. I also want to highlight a couple of events that I am working with. Arthur's Senior Care uh, sponsors Arthur's um, Memory Cafe, and we gather virtually the second and fourth Wednesday of each month at one o'clock at Central Time. So that'd be two um, if you're Eastern, noon Mountain Time, and 11 a.m. if you are out West Pacific Time. And you are more than welcome to, to join us on that. Also, I do a group just for care partners and that is sponsored by Brookdale North Oaks here in Minnesota. We typically try to get together um, in person but actually the last couple of meetings we have actually been online due to the the virus Um, and we get together the last Wednesday of each month so we're still hopeful maybe in February we'll be able to meet in person and we meet at 10 a.m central time. And again, you're more than welcome to join us there. I just got a flyer. Music Men's Minds is having a beautiful Valentine's Day Zoom with a surprise guest. Music Men's Minds is a music therapist that put on a program. And that will be February 14th, this coming Monday from 1130 to 1230. And you can go to musicmensmind.org and learn more about that. Also, if you're going to be in the Minnesota area in April, we are going to be doing a screening and talk back on the film, A Timeless Love. That'll be down in Winona, Minnesota. And that'll be April 7th at 630, a Thursday night. And Friday, Uh, at 1 p.m. on the 8th. You can register uh, to to join us by calling 507-454-5212. And um, really looking forward to that. We haven't done a movie screening in two years now. Uh, Last, I just want to give a shout out to Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner. They are absolutely phenomenal. And we're going to hear what they have to say about the foot bar walker next. And then we'll be right back with our guest. I love the foot bar walker. And let me tell you why. It is the option for my toolbox that I've been waiting for. Let's be honest. There are some clients who, despite our best rehab efforts, just aren't able to return to performing a sit to stand transfer on their own. Now I can offer my caregivers an easier, safer option that doesn't involve hoisting their loved one up from a sitting position. 
I don't recommend this walker for all of my clients, but I do recommend this walker for those caregivers looking for an easier, safer option with transfers. I would also encourage other therapists to add this walker to their toolbox. It's kind of like having my own mobile parallel bars for the client to pull up on. Whether it's a family caregiver at home helping a loved one with Parkinson's or dementia, CNAs in a long-term care facility assisting their patients, or therapists adapting to client and caregiver-specific needs, we now have a very safe and effective option to offer in the Footbar Walker. Check this product out at thefootbarwalker.com. That's it for today from Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner. Have a great day, and don't forget, if you can't do it, adapt it. So today I'm really excited to introduce you to Edgar Cortez. He goes by the pen name Milo Lorian. He is a Latin a neurodiverse man who is a husband, a father, and a disabled Marine. He was diagnosed with early onset neurocognitive decline and now the doctors are calling it major neurocognitive disorder due to traumatic brain injury. In addition, he's dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and a couple other medical issues. At the age of 51, he hopes to change the world and how they view the diagnosis and how we treat others. He is also the author of With Love, Leo. So Edgar, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show today. Um, thank you for, for having your time. me. I always start out the conversation by asking people if they have in their own family and circle of friends, others who are dealing with a dementia. I, I highlighted that, you know, you are dealing with that yourself, but are there other family members or friends? Um, I, I have, I have a, um, well, that I know of, there's two uncles that supposedly have Alzheimer's, um, is what I've heard, you know, in family circles, not like directly from whoever's taking care of them. And, and, and I suppose part of what got this started was both of my grandmothers, my, my paternal grandmother had Alzheimer's. I, I saw that firsthand and my maternal grandmother had something. Um, I don't know that it was diagnosed properly, but she also had COPD and, you know, but they were both well into their eighties. Okay. So that got me concerned early on, but, but for me, it turned out to be a little different. Okay. So let's talk about your diagnosis and, and how you, how you've dealt with that. And now you're a writer and how that, how has your neurocognitive issues affected the writing process for you? Um, yeah, you know, it's a good question. I, I, I mean, I, I, I've had this for so long, and I didn't really write before then. Um, I guess I've always written in some form. I mean, my my first job in the in the Marines was an admin clerk, and I used to write, you know, uh, replies to congressional requests and and you know award citations and you know office work, and uh, so I've always been around words in that way professionally but I uh even as a criminal investigator you know writing reports and and interviews and you know always documenting things there's always a cause to document something going on but it, the process has been very it was very I don't want to say haphazard I mean I see all these authors who have outlines and they have you know all these different systems for how they write and I would just write as it came to me and then, you know, put this chapter together with this chapter and move this around. And it was all sort of organic for me until I was finally like, OK, this is it. This is what we're going for. Let's let's go ahead and, you know, go through and and, uh, you know, as you were go over it over and again. But things started to fall in the right places. OK, so chaotic, maybe. <laughs> And I don't remember most of it either, which is an odd thing for an author, I guess, to say. But I wrote the book, but at best, I can give you the broad strokes. Okay. So the book we're talking about is um, With Love, Leo. And what made you decide to write the book in the first place? 
I, I've well, thought about it and I've thought about it and I've thought about it and I, and I have pieces, but I've never, I've never really totally pulled my books together. And I know I've got more than one in me. So I'm always fascinated with how people decided to, to really step into it. And do it was it. a promise that it was a promise I made to my wife. Okay. You know, she always said what a good writer I was. She's always said I had a, a talent for words and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, one day I, I told her how, and I, and I'd always wanted to write a book. I just never knew what it was about. And I, I told her one day that I was going to, I forget how I said it. I told her I was going to write her a book and win her a Pulitzer or something, you know, it's one of those things you do. And, and then, so over time as this, this illness of mine sort of, progressed you know that one question came up about what i'm putting her through and what i'm going to continue to put her through in the future and you know what the eventualities that could happen with that and then what she'd have to endure and you know that whole thing and, and the one thing i didn't want her to do was to be defined by it i didn't i wanted her to move on you know, there's always that, oh, you know, every couple says, oh, what, what are you going to do if I die? You know, are you going to marry somebody else or, you know, stay away from so-and-so. And, you know, there's always those married couples always have those those things. But I, I just I just want her to be able to find some some kind of happiness. And uh, and it sort of led to this. How could I be there for her? if I wasn't there for her, you know? So, you know, having read the book, you see how, how that's really kind of how it is. It's, it's my attempt to be there for her and get her back to laughing and smiling when, you know, when I, when I inflict that ultimate pain. Um, and it sounds straight and morbid to some people, but you know, it is what it is. I mean, the science is undeniable. So ignoring it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. So I decided to sort of face it head on and, and write her the book. And, you know, she cries every time she has to read it. So she won't read it anymore. But she helped me with the process of putting it together. And, and it took, I want to say, about a year before she finally decided to help me get it self-published. Because I tried that. I tried to find an agent and, you know, that whole thing. But that's a... Uh, that's a people skill I don't have. And everybody wants something completely different when you submit. I mean, yeah. there's no like one process to it. So I just decided to do it on my own to keep the promise before I couldn't. Yeah. Well, and I think too, people still have this thing, you know, I'll get a book publisher and they're going to pay me to do this and da, 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 da. And it's not like that anymore. I mean, if you're a really right. big name, you know, they'll pay you. But even when it comes to the marketing nowadays, they want, they want to see from you, how big is your audience? How are you going to get this out there? I mean, it, it's totally flipped um, in terms of what it is. So you said that you self-published, which is what most people are doing these days because they, the other process, it, it just, um, it's too heavy you know, and it takes too long and there's, there's too many rejection letters. And Oh yeah. And they almost that. want you to, they almost want you to sell it yourself mm -hmm. and then they'll just pick up the phone call phone and dial somebody to, you know, it's like, I thought that's what you did, you know, but that's not how it works anymore. You're right. Yeah. It's changed a lot. It's, it's changed a lot. So you said you went through the, the publishing process, but your wife helped you with that because um, I've heard that it's complicated and then people say once they've done it, then they, they kind of have, <laughs> have it down, but stepping into it. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a foreign land with lots of little kind of, uh, um, mind bombs all over the place. Cause you don't really understand the terminology and what they're asking for. And it's something that you have to sort of learn and, and, you know, being that this illness is, one of the one of the downsides is learning new things. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm pretty much stuck with the skills I had in year X, whatever year that was, and that's it. I can try to learn things, but nothing sticks. 
And, uh, and the other part of it was a gift. You know, I gifted it to her when I wrote it. So there's a time frame between when I finished writing it and when, you know, now that now that I put it out there. And so I wanted, you know, it was hers. So I wanted her to sort of be in charge of all the decisions to be done. So, you know, it's, it's really sort of she made an LLC and we published it. You know, I say I published it, but it's her thing. It's, it was her. It's her property, as it were, mm-hmm. because that's what I wanted it to be. Mm-hmm. Now, in the um, in the writing process itself, did you, you know, kind of come up with this idea and just start doing notes, or did you kind of outline chapters, or how did yeah, that I didn't, flow for I you? didn't do any of that traditional. I started with if you read the first chapter, you see where it starts, mm-hmm. right? Where she's sitting there and mourning, and and I went from there. Like I, I tried to picture what she might do, and um, and then how I could add to that, how I could change that, how I could, how I could get her out of that chair, how I could get her back to life. So, um, it's sort of, it's fictional, but it isn't, you know what I mean? So I forget the wording I inspired by real life because it is, it's, it's, you know, I've taken little elements and then sort of put them together one chapter at a time. Um, like there's a, I know there's a chapter about, um, about my trying to fumble without her Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I meant to show just how dependent you become on somebody and there's ways to sort of self-program to make it a little bit easier, you know, but the metrics, when you're talking about making it easier on the person taking care of you, I mean, the metrics are skewed, you know? Um, because easier isn't necessarily easier, but by the same token, you, you know, people always say things can be a lot harder. So there's that in between that I do my best to, to, to give her, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I, and I hope the book carries that across well. Um, well, I think one of the things, you know, in reading the book, it, it's, you know, you seem to know her very well in terms of, you know, and, sh- and she, she may or may not <laughs> agree or disagree with that, but um, from a reader level, it just seemed like you, you knew her buttons, her patterns, her, her likes, her dislikes, her, her friendships, you know, um, and, and what could, what could help. And, and I just thought, gosh, for someone to take the time to, to really think about, okay, I'm going to be gone. How can, how can I help somebody when I'm not here? Um, I, I thought you did that in a beautiful fashion in terms of, of realizing the impact that losing a loved one has on anybody at, at any level, but especially a spouse. And, you know, when they have cared for somebody as long as they've cared for, and I, you know, I've lost both my parents and that is, you know, you, you can't equate that to a spouse by any means, but I, I felt totally lost. I mean, I didn't even know who I was anymore because the space had opened up and again, it wasn't my spouse. And so I can't even imagine what that, what that would feel like. And, um, and so I, I thought it was really interesting. I thought you, your writing, it pulls you in right away. It's just a very comfortable storyline and, and, um, you're just intrigued, I think, from from the get go, you know, with the with the book itself. Do you want to share with people one or two pieces of how you chose to comfort her? Well, I I uh, you know when the kids were little, uh, you know that show Blues Clues. Mm-hmm. Where when the kids were little, I used to do these little uh, treasure hunts for them. Um, so that's sort of where the treasure hunt thing came from. Um, I sort of, in the book, I set her friend on her to, you know, to, to, I sort of put her on this treasure hunt back to life Mm -hmm. um, and finding out what I was doing when she wasn't around. um, You know, I had to, like you said, it it pulls you in, right? You know, you're saying that the the book pulls you in, but the, the story was about pulling my wife in pulling my wife into this little, this little blues clues hunt 
this little treasure hunt so that she would forget the morning. So she would move away from that and, and, you know, start to be inquisitive again and start to wonder and smile and laugh and, you know, those sorts of things to remember the good stuff. I mean, you know, there's some stuff in the book, like the ad, did you read about the ad? That one I missed because it kind of popped around in it. Well, that's a true story. I took mm-hmm. out an ad and in the newspaper for Valentine's Day. I wrote a love letter and I put it in the newspaper. Um, I used to be prone to grand gestures in that way. And, you know, my wife and I, like, I remember what she was wearing. Oddly enough, I remember what she was wearing the day we met her, the day I met her. And, uh, and that was, I don't know, going on 28, 29 years ago or some, some such. And, uh, and we've always sort of been joined at the hip. I mean, we, I remember when she retired from the army, my wife's a uh, retired soldier. And when she retired from the army after 22 years, her first job, we worked together in army recruiting and we sat next to each other. And people wondered if that was going to be a problem because we were sitting right next to each other. And that was some of the best times of our marriage because we just, I don't know, that's just who we are. I mean, surely I get on her nerves, but, you know, who doesn't? Mm -hmm. But she doesn't get on my nerves. Um, So, you know, there was a lot of that sort of feeling that I wanted her to think about, that I wanted to sort of pull her character, if you will, back into and, and not into that, the darkness. I mean, I have... I myself, through all my PTSD and TBI and then, you know, early onset, I have experienced the darkness of depression. And, and uh, so I guess I use that to figure out how I would pull her out. of it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it started with her girlfriend. I mean, a girlfriend is the, probably the, the best place you can start, I would think, mm-hmm. in a situation like that. And in her case, it's a girlfriend that they don't even have to talk to each other all the time. So that's, that's, you know, that's how I, that's how I began to pull her into this, into this, um, this little treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing that I really liked about the book is that it addresses grief. I mean, a lot of times, you know, I mean, and you even write in the book, when everyone's left, when everyone's walked away, you know, that person is is still sitting there alone. And I know for several friends who have lost um, their spouses um, at a young age, they said a lot of times it didn't even hit them for months later, because they were so busy, being busy, um, you know, doing things, but their life had had drastically changed and people had pulled away. And I love the way even when her friend uh, is telling her stuff, she knows to pause, give her a Kleenex, get me a cup of coffee just to give her something to do, to take a break, to allow her to process those feelings. Because I think so often we don't have somebody there that lets us feel what we need to feel, or we're told, you know, you should be over that by now or get on with it, you know, get, you know, get on a dating app. That's the the big Mm -hmm. thing, fill the gap, you know, and it's like, that's not real life for most people. This is going to be an ongoing kind of wave of emotion that hits at different levels at different times. And um, it'll knock you down and, you know, you'll get back up again and it'll knock you down again, but allowing people to, to feel that and then recenter themselves so that they can go forward. And I can't remember exactly what she said, but it was something like, all right, let's get back to it. What else you got to say? <laughs> yeah, see, that's, you know, that was where I, I tried to intrigue the character with mm-hmm. what is it you know about my husband that I don't, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, and I left letters for her because I, I think so often people, when they grieve, I mean, I, I lost my mom in my 20s um, to a drunk driver and there's lots of things I'd want to ask her. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I imagine when someone loses a spouse, there's, 
I can't tell you the number of conversations that that I have to have with my wife about things, all fashions of things. It's like it's, it's the thoughts aren't complete until we've had a conversation about it. And I've asked her what she thought. So, you know, the idea was to leave a box of letters so that I could she could talk to me, even though I'm not there mm-hmm. on any topic to include the dating and, you know, all the eventualities. Because, you know, five years down the road, you lose your spouse, you still want it. You still wonder what their opinion might be. Yep. Especially when you're together for such a long time. So, you know, that that was part of that was part of the scenario was leaving these boxes of letters and, and stuff so that she could have conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you say conversations, because some people go, well, how is she going to have a conversation with you? You know, conversations are, are I think people, people have lost a, a certain handle on the art of discourse, mm-hmm. you know, and some conversations are rhetorical, some are not. Some are just a matter of exchanging opinions. I mean, you have people like, you know, Einstein and, and that level of character in our history who had so many conversations just through correspondence. You know, it doesn't require somebody always sitting in front of me. Um, and especially when they're not there anymore. I can't imagine a single widow or widower who, you know, <laughs> wouldn't do anything for a, a, a conversation, a letter, a video that they hadn't had before. Some new exchange of opinions and words. So I, I you know, I tried to convey that and I tried to. I tried to throw in there a lot of those repetitive things that people say over the years. Um, like, oh yeah, he always said this and he always said that. And, and, you know, and I, and I hope that people wouldn't take it about me so much as her take on me, her dependence on that shared sort of discourse that we had over the years and how that has to morph for a person to move on. Well, in those, like you said, those sayings, they just, they just bring a smile to your face when you think about, oh yeah, they always, I mean, you, you almost can't think it without smiling, you know, because it's just at the core of the soul of the person and who, and who they were. And it's such a deep, deep um, memory because it played over so many times. Like, (laughs) you know, you can, you can hear the voice. You can, I mean, you can, you can see them physically, you know, doing whatever gesture goes with that thing or, or the eye roll or whatever it is. I mean, it just, um, and and I think that that is normal. And yet it's stuff that we don't really talk about. With Nobody nobody wants to talk about it. And and I, and I thought, I thought it was important I thought it was important to show the transition, right? That there has to be a transition for a person to come out of that grief. I mean, like you say, it's, it's never gone, but you have to find a way to transform it into something you can carry more easily. Yeah. Something that isn't going to drown you and get in your, get in the way of the rest of your life because you still have the rest of your life. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I have found um, through grief, because I think we all spin down that black hole, you know, where we just think we're going to get sucked right out of the universe altogether um, at times, um, dementia or not, um, loss is loss is loss. Um, and everybody feels it at different levels. But for me, when I would feel like I was really kind of going down that, that black hole, uh, for whatever reason, something came to me. And I, to me, I think it was really just kind of channeled into me, like, knock it off. You still have work to do. But what came to me was you can't have great grief without first having great love. And, yeah. and what an honor that is. And I see your book honoring that great love and having all those little remembrances in different fashions and, you know, shared alone and shared with friends, you know, all of those different pieces just add to the remembering, the honoring of the relationship, which nobody wants to just push it away. Like it didn't happen. You know, you, you want to know how, 
how do you honor that? I think one of the best ways to honor a relationship is by being authentic, by being able to laugh and cry through it. Doing just one side to me isn't authentic. I don't know. That's just my, you know, I think there's a range of emotions when it comes to that. You know, one of the things I talk about in the book, I know I mentioned it, I don't remember how I mentioned it, but, you know, I put a lot of my own thoughts into the book. And one of them is, you can be proud or you can be married, but you can't always be both. Mm -hmm. And I've taught my sons that because it's, we live in this world where ego and image and, and all these factors are sort of drive people, but, but then they wonder why things go wrong. And it's like, look, we, we are all human beings and you take away that outer shell that, that, you know, the world is concerned with that you want to portray to the world and, you know, it's like men are crybabies when they're sick. There's no getting around it. You know, we no just argument don't. from me on that one. We don't have to. Ad- you don't have to admit it, but when you're sick, you're gonna do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and so that whole the the proud or married married. I mean, it's. I remember a, a guy one time talking about the getting a, a feminine products at the store, mm-hmm. and I thought that's got to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like you can't get them because somebody's going to see you. (laughs) I mean, are you, you know, are you a husband or aren't you? Because one day it may be, are you a father or aren't you? You know, it is needed. It's, it's stop being so squeamish about it. It's just what it is. And so that same, that same idea of proud or married is, it's not like you can't be proud, but, you can't, you can't always have, you can't always have the image you want and, and still be married. I mean, you can't be, you know, you can't be this man and that whole nonsense Mm -hmm. and then still be a loving, tender husband sometimes. Yeah. The two aren't, uh, they're not mutually exclusive, but they're not, they're often in conflict. Yeah. Well, and and one is clearly more important than the other. Yeah. And to me, the proud really gets into, you know, I would refer to it as the ego, which a lot of people go, oh, you know, new age, and they kind of push it out and stuff. And proud, I think, is something that um, people can relate to without going, oh, ego, because people don't like to be told that their ego is a little bit too strong. (laughs) Yeah, you know, and I talk in the book, I I actually talk in the book a little bit about uh, my thoughts on on what we've inherited from our fathers Mm -hmm. and their fathers and, and the nonsense that we're expected to carry and, and how we shouldn't. And, and, you know, I don't know, there was something in there about a a particular couple and um, the woman being cautious or something. And I talk about how it's, it's her right. She has every reason to be cautious and it's, you know, it's us that we have to, I would say us, but, you know, younger men, yes, like younger men are in way um, paying the price for the idiocracy, if you will, of the generations before, but it's just what you have to do. Mm-hmm. It, it has to be done. You know, it's not one of those, oh, it's not my problem. It is your problem. Yeah. And it is your responsibility to make it different in lots of senses, really. What, what is your hope that people get out of your book? I hope they see life differently. I hope they can enjoy life more. I hope they can understand what unconditional love is. I mean, people say my best friend and they got like 43 of them. I don't have any friends. I mean, I have friends, I have people I know, people I grew up with, people, quaint, you know, whatever, but there's nobody calling me to see what's going on. There's nobody, you know, I don't have what you would consider a best friend. The closest I had died a number of years ago um, to, I don't, I don't even know what it was exactly. Um, but, uh, which that's a whole nother story, but my point is, I want people to appreciate life on a different level Mm -hmm. in all facets. 
You know, I want people to stop saying I love you when they don't. Because when you say it, it has to mean something. You know, but if you can understand what it means, well, you can say it more often to the right people. You know, I, I mean, I have, you know, three sons who are still at home. And they're all between 19 and 25. Because there's no hurry. I don't subscribe to pushing kids out at 18 and they're men now. No, they're not. Their the brains don't even stop developing until they're 25. They're not grown. And we all know they're not grown, but it's an excuse. Like 18 is an excuse to get rid of them. You know, and, and in this day and age, they should live at home as long as possible so they can afford to move out when it's time. But you know, my boys aren't <laughs> I probably get mad at me for throwing them out there, but they're not, you know, they're not out there chasing skirts as it were, or they haven't had a million relationships or, you know, and, and I'm hoping it's because I taught them to take these things serious as, as serious as getting your driver's license when you're ready. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the kinds of things I hope people get uh, from the book, as well as what it's like to be me. Mm -hmm. What it's like to, you know, there's the one chapter where I I'm, forget where I'm at and forget who I'm talking to. And I, I, you know, I meet a, my granddaughter, and but I didn't know it was her. And, and that's a little side thing for me because I have three granddaughters who are just, they're adorable. And, and I don't live near them and I don't get to visit them and I don't really get to see them or interact with them or be in their lives anymore. It's, it's again, it's, it's another reality. There's, mm -hmm. there's just no getting around it. Yeah. Well, one of the things I, I hope two people take out of your book and maybe others, maybe, maybe there'll be some others that decide, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to put a book together for a person or my family or whatever it might be. But even just a little thing in terms of writing letters or stories and just keeping them. So when your time does come, even if it's not a formal thing, there's a, there's a treasure to be found of what was important to you, what you appreciated about them, what was, what was funny, what, you know, all those different moments that we live through. I used to be in real estate. And so uh, for 25 years, and, you know, I dealt with a lot of people going through transitions and they loved running across those types of things. They were like, I had no idea, you know, and they just, they get lost in it. They just stop what they're doing and they just get, they just get lost in the stories and being able to, to relive those moments. And then to have something physical, you know, that you, that you have, and, and maybe it's, maybe it's written, maybe it's video, maybe it's audio nowadays. I mean, my gosh, people, you got a lot of choices out there to, <laughs> you to record yourself in things. VR now. now. I saw, I saw an ad yesterday for a VR camera. I was like, wow. Yep. I think there's a lot people can get out of this in terms of even just your contemplation of, I'm not going to be here forever. And how can I make the world a better place once I'm, once I've gone to, to the people I love? You know, how do I pull that? How do I pull that together? I mean, that that's a big thoughtful piece in and of itself. And I think there's a lot of people out there, again, not everybody, but a lot of people that have a diagnosis that know it's terminal and they do nothing. No, we're not even considered terminal. The, the, the society at large wouldn't consider this a terminal disease. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get up, I, I know my name, I, mm -hmm. you know, I remember my name and I woke up. I mean, that's, I always tell people that's, that's it. That's a plus, but what else is there yep. in the day? For the most part, nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I try to do this or, you know, everybody tries to do these things, but it's not a full life. It's not jam packed with, you know, there's no, you know, the only real purpose sometimes is getting to the end of the day. Mm -hmm. without falling into that deep, dark hole. Mm -hmm. But nobody's looking for my opinions anymore. Nobody's wondering where I am or what I'm doing or, you know, I have no, no place to be. I'm not late for anything. You know, I'm not missing from a crowd. I'm just, I just sort of exist on the, on the edges of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, 
a lot harder for some people, Mm -hmm. you know, and and I think for me, it's, it's been made a little bit easier in the sense that I never got to have a career. I never got to firmly establish myself in the place to be missing from. I mean, I'm 51, you know, and this has been going on for a very long time. And I think, I think people underestimate that. You know, somebody's 75, like my dad, he's 76 or something. And, you know, he he would never say he has issues, but I think he has issues. But he worked for General Electric for 35 years. He has that bulk of his life and friends and and whatnot that can sustain a person because they feel like they've lived and they feel like they're retired. And, you know, in his case, he retired when they had the accident. Um, and so, you know, that retirement thing, I think really helps people, but more and more, you're going to see people like me, Mm -hmm. military vets, and you're going to more and more see people like me who never really got to start life. And, and it, I think it adds to a lot of the contemplation in the book, um, because deep is pretty much the only place I can really go anymore. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense to people, but surface chit chat stuff is, I I don't know. I don't even think I can do that stuff anymore, Mm -hmm. you know, because that's part of a different type of living. Yep. Yep. Um, But I think a lot of people don't go deep often enough. Sure. Not all the time, but often enough, they don't even, they don't even delve into it. I think people are scared of it. Yeah, they're scared to be authentic because what are other people going to think? And they're so worried. We've gotten to be such a judgmental society. And, oh, um, you know, and then you, you add in now the, the virus and the politics. And I mean, it's, it's dangerous to speak your truth these days. It can be. Yeah. I mean, that's how I think people feel that, uh, you know, I just don't want to go there. It's too, it's too stressful. And so they don't. And yet there are depths you can go to within um to frame the world a little bit different and to you know look at things deeper on how do how do i make the how do i make this space a little bit better for the next guy you know and and by sharing your story i mean you could have easily just written that for your wife and have it go no further you know done done your job of i'm going to help her through this but you two decided Maybe this can help others too. Yeah, and I think that came in part as in part through you know the other advocacy stuff I try to do and and helping people understand and 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 you know that's this last year when I started doing this understanding neurocognitive and the other stuff I realized that people don't get it they they don't understand what this is or how hard it is and uh, how how isolating it is. Mm-hmm. I'd go a whole day and not talk to anybody. And that's not to say my wife doesn't talk to me, but what is it there to talk about? Mm-hmm. You know, what am I doing that provides for conversation or what is she doing other than taking care of every single little thing? Um, it's, it, it's a, uh, I mean, look, even the, the veterans administration has me as temporarily disabled. I mean, it's, it's, how can they not know? How can they how can they turn a blind eye to the fact that it's completely permanent and and it's not going anywhere and it's not going to get better and it's not going to be treated and cured? I mean, it, these are things that I say that sound stupid because everybody knows this. We just don't want to talk about it. It's like yeah. if we don't have hope, then it's not worth a conversation. But I am one of probably millions upon millions of people who aren't even counted in statistics. Mm -hmm. Which is really (coughs) sad because we we can't solve a problem if we don't if we don't acknowledge it exists. That's true. We can't fix it until we start talking about it. and, And everybody's only half talking about it. And 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 I think that's probably part of the challenge to even getting people to read my book is it's the topic that most people don't want to hear about Mm -hmm. most people don't want to it's too depressing for people you know 
And uh, I, I mean, I, I was pleasantly surprised. I was honored, really, that uh, uh, Mariel Hemingway had writ- wrote it. She actually left a review on my Amazon page. You know, but some people understand this, this topic, and, and other people run from it mm-hmm. as far as possible. Yep. But I think it's it's one of those things like, you know, you, you see these you see these stories all the time about generally it's little kids who have been hurt or or have some sort of ailment or something. And and the people around them talk about how much they learn mm-hmm. from them, how much different their how, how different their lives have been being involved. And and I think that's very true. I think if we stop running from people like me, we will learn so much more about our own lives or their own lives. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and they are more, you know, people who aren't like me can do more with the information they'd learn, you know? Yep. And, and that's, this is part of what I hope the book is, is, you know, paints a better, a, a, a better understanding of people like me while also helping them to, I don't know, gives them something that would make their lives better, mm-hmm. more, I don't know, more cherish, cherishing them more and taking less for granted. And, and, you know, in the end, they're better selves as it were. Yeah. And, you know, with any book, some people will love it. Some people will hate it. You know, it just, you know, and when you are tackling a, a tough topic, um, you know, that can become more volatile and stuff for people too. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, are you planning on writing, a, you know, another book at all? Do you have anything in mind or? I, I do. Um, uh, there's a couple of things I want to write about. Um, one of them is sort of, you know, and, and I write, I write it in fiction because for one, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. So sometimes there's a story in my head and I know it's not 100% right. You know what I mean? And with people like me, it's our memories are subjective to the moment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes I say, oh, I saw this thing the other day. It could have been an hour ago. It could have been three weeks ago. It's just, I say the other day, or I say I saw a little while ago, but I know that I can't be a hundred percent on the when Mm -hmm. I just remembered. And I may have already repeated myself and told you this before. So I chose to write these things in fiction to sort of rem- remove that ambiguity of, of the facts. Some mm-hmm. stuff is factual. Some stuff is, you know, creative license to make it fit. Um, but I, I want to do one that's sort of a life story because there are facets of my life story, I think, that also fall into the sort of same character or, same areas to grief, you know, like being brown, Mm -hmm. being brown in America is a thing that I don't think everybody understands. You know, I'm a Latino who doesn't belong to any of the major Latin groups. And I have found myself in situations where I wasn't Latin enough, but then I was too Latin for other groups or, you know, there's a, there's an area there where, where we reside when you don't belong to a major group or, you know, uh, my, both of my parents were born in another country. So it's uh, a first generation, I suppose. And that takes on its own topic because not everybody you meet that's talking about immigration and being immigrants actually has any immediate family that, you know, were born and raised in another country. Mm-hmm. A lot of times it's a historical sort of ethnic thing, which is fine. I'm, I'm not knocking. I'm just saying it's a different experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my, my life in general is, it's been interesting. I mean, I've lived through a house fire and, you know, my, my, my mom being hit by a drunk driver. And <clears throat> I remember they, uh, he did a year. And the police never arrested him. They just gave him a call and asked him to turn himself in. And uh, it, it was a really different experience being that I was carrying a badge at the time. 
And I thought they what? And what? And, you know, he's like did like 10 months or something. And he was drunk and high and it wasn't his first offense. And for the longest time I couldn't figure it out, but they didn't seem to have any really care about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was divorced young. I had kids from another marriage. I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm not saying were necessarily traumatic in, for me, but um, they're all relevant experiences. Yep. yep. Into things that I want to leave for not just my children, but for the world at large. Mm-hmm. Because I think that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, I was I was wondering too if, after reading this book if your wife has thought about would it make sense for her to write a book of what a care partner could do to prepare for a loss for themselves if if that's triggered anything. And I and I know not everyone is a writer. But I but I just thought oh that would be an interesting side cuz people worry about that if they talk about it or not. I mean, it's just a natural, it's a natural thought when someone has a diagnosis. And I was just interested if, if she had thought of anything that she could do proactively to help what you pointed out. You know, my wife is an interesting topic because uh, I've mentioned to her that she should write a book. Mm -hmm. My wife is of Mexican heritage. Mm -hmm. She was born and raised in Watts, California, South Central, you know, that whole thing. She did 22 years in the Army. She was a drill sergeant, airborne, criminal investigator herself. And then, you know, she retired and and then she had to start dealing with me. You know, it came out, that's about when time my stuff started coming out. So, you know, then I have the whole PTSD and agoraphobia and and you know, she had to deal with that. And then my failed back surgery. So then there becomes the physical limitation. And then of course the, the neurocognitive stuff and, you know, it just continues to add. So, you know, there was the house fire and there's her taking care of everything. And then the three boys. and, And I stayed home with the boys when she was in the military, after I got out, I stayed home with them when they were toddlers and stuff, but then she took over. And then uh, she ended up going to nursing school just to take better care of me. Mm-hmm. And then the year before the, the pandemic started, she got her bachelor's and her associates in the same year. <laughs> wow. And she's, a, you know, she's in her 50s. She's a few years older than I am. So she was what, probably 55 or so when this happened. When she, when she got her bachelor's degree and stuff. I mean, that's not the generally an age you go to finish that, but you know, she did that to set the example and to, and to improve and to, you know, for the benefit of not just herself, but the family yet she can't go to work or do anything with it Mm -hmm. because she still has to take care of me and I can't be left alone for, for that kind of necessarily that kind of time. So, you know, she's, she's taking care of me, tried to do stuff. She has her own sort of nuanced experiences. And yet she's in many ways as stuck as I am because of this illness Mm -hmm. from, you know, from proceeding in life and and having a a life as it were. So I've talked to her about writing a book, but, but I don't know if she will. Well, and not every, like I said, not everyone is a writer. um, And and that's not up their alley. It, It definitely, um, you can't say that, you know, she, I mean, she really, she's done a lot in her life. She's done a lot with her, with her life, um, which is uh, commendable in and of itself. I think like I said, I just thought it was interesting um, to think of it from the other side and what the possibilities would be there. But um, I want to let people know how to get a hold of you. So you have an Instagram account, which is understanding neurocognitive. We have a link for your social media, which has a little bit of everything on there with Linktree. 
that is uh, on the blog and the radio page and all of that stuff. And again, that is under his, um, his pen name. And, uh, but again, I can't thank you enough for your time and your efforts. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm always amazed when people get a book out because I know how much work it is <laughs> to do, but I really do appreciate you taking the time today and sharing it with us. Thank you for having me. Well, to our listeners, you know, if you like this show, like, click and share. Don't keep things a secret. That's how we all do better. Share the information that you have and just make the world spin a little bit, a little bit easier, a little bit safer for everyone out there. So until next time, uh, have a wonderful week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.